civil war in Syria intensifies. The White House is reportedly days away on aiding rebels in their battle against government troops. In Syria, hundreds more dead, many of them children. The United Nations has revealed a shocking new figure from Syria's civil war. Five thousand people are being killed each month. Do you know five thousand people? And if you do, they're all being killed every month. There are now more than four million Syrian refugees. That's a sixth of the population. The war has raged for almost four years. Syria is in ruins. And whatever strategy the U.S. has regarding Syria is simply failing. The civil war there continues to rage. This is the civil war within the civil war. Nearly a thousand groups are now fighting on its soil. But none more powerful, wealthy, and violent as ISIS, also known as Daesh. It has routed the Syrian and Iraqi armies to fence off nearly 10 million people and control the region's oil and gas production. You couldn't have done it in secret. You couldn't have done it, uh, uh, you know, uh, without anybody taking notice uh, unless they were closing their eyes. Meanwhile, U.S. President Barack Obama is compelled to make a confession. If anyone thought the president was ready to order airstrikes against ISIS targets in Syria, he made it clear today he is not. Good afternoon, everybody. Rooting out a cancer like ISIL will not be quick or easy, but I'm confident that we can and we will, working closely with our allies and our partners. But I don't want to put the cart before the horse. We don't have a strategy yet. President Obama is acknowledging that U.S. intelligence agencies underestimated the threat from ISIL while overestimating Iraq's army. Syria is left alone. The main concern now is Daesh's advance in Iraq. The ISIL now controls more than 95,000 square kilometers in Syria, which is 50% of the country's entire territory. It's the early hours of August the 3rd, 2014. Daesh has just seized the northern Iraqi district of Sinjar on the Syrian border. When IS invaded their villages, they called the Yazidis devil worshippers. And the home of the Yazidi minority quickly transforms into a chamber of mass executions and rape. Daesh militants swept across Yazidi areas in northern Iraq, killing the men and boys and enslaving the women and girls. We can see the people below, trapped on Sinjar Mountain. They're clustered. They're clustered under olive trees right now, waving to us. House Speaker agrees. These are barbarians. They intend to kill us. And if we don't destroy them first, we're going to pay the price. Barack Obama can no longer ignore the threat. At the request of the Iraqi government, we've begun operations to help save Iraqi civilians stranded on the mountain. Four days after the capture of Sinjar, the U.S. is back at war. American F-A-18 fighter jets are flying over Iraq once again, this time targeting ISIS militants. There are good political and diplomatic reasons for not intervening, but it was a series of other developments that in a way got the American attention. It was the attack by ISIS on Sinjar and the attack on the Yazidi people and, the, and what looks like a genocide. And it was the execution of two uh, American journalists by ISIS in Raqqa. And it was the fact that ISIS was near the, the gates of uh, Erbil, the capital of the Kurdish uh, regional government uh, in northern Iraq. 
those are the things that got the attention of the American government. And then finally, the U.S. government began to develop a policy for dealing with ISIS. Despite coming under fire in Iraq, Daesh can still retreat to Syria uncontested. Your viewers may recall that initially, U.S. combat operations against Islamic State were exclusive to Iraq. The United States did not go into Syria at first. And this never made any sense to me because Islamic State doesn't respect national borders. In September 2014, Daesh storms Kobani, a Syrian city of Kurdish majority just paces away from the Turkish border. We're standing just to the east of Kobani. It's this key city here on the Turkey-Syria border. We have seen ISIS continue to advance and continue to bombard the city behind me. After four years of indecision, Obama finally orders the U.S. Air Force to Syria. Last night on my orders, America's armed forces began strikes against ISIL targets in Syria. Under U.S. leadership, regional powers, including the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, fight Daesh from the sky. We are leading a comprehensive international campaign to crush ISIS's claim of invincibility. Well, certainly Kobani was a very important point in the war. That was when the war turned uh, strategically. Was Kobani a turning point in the war? It was, and I guess the, the political turning point uh, was the uh, was the relationship that was established uh, between the U.S.-led coalition and uh, Kurdish fighters on the ground. The war still has room for more twists. With the rise of yet another armed group. You know, the YPG is the uh, Syrian affiliate of the PKK, which is a group that's on uh, the U.S. Uh, and uh, the Europeans, and certainly the Turkish, uh, the terrorism list. Yeah, it's listed as a terror group by the United States, it's listed as a terror group by Turkey, it's listed as a terror group by the European Union. So they basically sent out a kind of a signal to the PKK in northern Iraq, send personnel, we need them. And they did. With the help of the PKK, the YPG was able to run much of that region. Originally, there were no American contacts with this YPG militia, and very few discussions with its political side. We didn't really know them very well, and we certainly didn't understand the totality of their political agenda. I think what viewers need to understand is that this Syrian Kurdish group is part of a larger Kurdish nationalist movement. And its ultimate goal, its ultimate goal, um, is to create a Kurdish state. They don't say that very often publicly. Um, they understand the politics in the region are against it. Um, but when you talk to them individually, um, that becomes very clear. While the Daesh attack on Kobani brings U.S. jets to Syrian skies, the Pentagon relies on local forces to fight the battle down below. And so Obama wanted to combat the terrorists on the cheap, and that required um, some kind of a trustworthy fighting force. Kurdish fighters became indispensable as our main fighting force on the ground to take on uh, Islamic State. There was no ability to create a, a ground offensive against ISIS, and they turned to a Kurdish uh, militia instead. The U.S. helps the Syrian wing of the PKK terror group gain momentum with money, training, and weapons, but without much concern for what this means. What the Americans don't think about is that by supporting a Kurdish movement that wants the right of self-determination, they are necessarily threatening the territorial integrity of NATO ally Turkey. 
One of the challenges in Syria all along has been the very cross-cutting interests and objectives of different players in that particular country's civil war. Turkey understandably is concerned about the Syrian Kurds, uh, who may have ties with the PKK, the Turkish uh, Kurd terrorist group. And so you basically could see that uh, Kobani was a turning point in the sense that the Americans has decided pretty much uh, to abandon the war in Syria and the cause of the population of all of Syria and basically to come down on the side of a force that was very questionable. And you have to ask, at the end of the day, qui bono? Who, who, was, who were the beneficiaries of this? Well, the beneficiaries included the, uh, the Kurdish militia, they included the Assad regime, and the backers of the Kurdish militia who include Iran and Russia. The Americans began to help them, uh, not because the Americans understood the YPG, uh, they didn't help them because the Americans liked Syrian Kurds. The Americans didn't know Syrian Kurds. This is a, a situation in which the enemy of my enemy is not always necessarily my friend. I think the decision was made rapidly because the, uh, because the American-led coalition had no uh, indigenous ground force to battle ISIS in eastern Syria, and the United States and its allies were uh, unwilling, sadly unwilling, in my opinion, uh, to put forth a ground force to try to finish ISIS in eastern Syria quickly before ISIS would be able to mount terror operations in Europe and elsewhere. U.S. military dropped supplies for Kurdish forces for the first time since launching the air campaign against ISIS targets in Syria. Cargo planes dropped weapons, ammunition, and medical supplies. Three American C-130s dropping 27 separate bundles of ammunition, medical supplies, and food actually delivered uh, some M-16 rifles. By 2015, they were beginning to give a lot of help. This was causing problems with Turkey. Um, but it was also causing problems with uh, Arab communities in northeastern Syria. No respite for those who are living here, trapped between ISIL and Kurdish forces advancing towards the area. The Kurds have the final say here. Reports have been uh, persistent enough to persuade me that the Kurdish YPG uh, has at times strong-armed uh, civilians in various areas. But it would seek to solve this, uh, this problem of, uh, of having a Kurdish-led organization uh, trying to dictate local affairs in non-Kurdish areas. I'm sure critics would say that this was not done the right way, but the conclusion that was reached, and I was part of the, the team that reached that conclusion, was that um, there was no other. There, there was no, there, this illusory third force that was gonna be Turkish-backed, that was gonna be non-Kurdish, that was gonna fight ISIS. We tried again and again, and that force never materialized. The Americans, for a long time, tried to make the argument, especially the American military, that the YPG was not connected to the PKK. The American military has finally stopped making that argument um, after there was too much evidence. This evidence forces the U.S. Secretary of Defense to confess that the Pentagon has joined forces with a terror group, which has been attacking Turkey for decades. Reports indicate that they're aligned or at least have substantial ties to the PKK. Is that true? Uh, yes, we have an, uh, uh, Is the uh, PKK a effect. terrorist organization in the eyes of the Turkish government? Uh, yeah, the PKK is a terrorist organization not only in the eyes of the Turkish government, but in the eyes of the U.S. government as well, uh, Senator. Just a year later, the spokesman for combined task force against Daesh seems to have forgotten what his superior has already confirmed. To your knowledge, you can state that none of the YPG uh, that are being supported by the coalition are also dual-headed, 
as PKK? You can say that confidently? Uh, I, I can say that we have observed no evidence that that's the case. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of the Republic of Turkey. Please be seated, everybody. Good afternoon. So again, Mr. Prime Minister, I want to thank you for being here and for being such a strong ally and partner in the region and around the world. We knew the cost in terms of the relationship with Turkey. We knew that this organization, the YPG, had very close ties. It was an affiliate, the Syrian affiliate of the PKK, an organization that the U.S. has listed as a terrorist organization. So those were real drawbacks. Look, the contradiction begins with the fact that under U.S. law, a uh, U.S. administration cannot provide material or other support to a group that's listed as uh, a terror group. This is such balderdash, it's, it's completely untrue. So your experts uh, and their opinions about uh, the future of Turkish U.S. relations based on work that was done with the YPG, um, they don't have a crystal ball, uh, and nor have they, I don't think, recognized the legitimate threat that we saw uh, from Daesh on the ground at that time. To avoid the embarrassment of arming and financing a terror group, the U.S. gives the YPG a new name, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Washington, when it referred to them as the PKK, they were called the YPG, and then over time, the SDF, as the YPG increasingly uh, worked alongside uh, other militants. But Turkey is right to point out um, that many of these Kurdish fighters uh, are indistinguishable from the PKK. One thing to fight an insurgency and to be listed as a terror group, but another thing to try to say, oh, we're just going to rebrand and call ourselves something different now, when it's the same people with the same goal. It's a very difficult problem to be in. I, I don't think that the PKK can just simply rebrand. I think it's an entity that probably has to be uh, dismantled. Many of these people wear different T-shirts on different days. Some days they are simply YPG and anti-Dash, interested in the same strategic goals as the coalition. Other days, they're terrorists. أثناء تأسيس القوى السورية الديمقراطية كنت أنا من أعضاء المؤسسين واستلمت عدة مناصب فيها عضو القيادة العامة وعضو الهيئة السياسية لمجلس السورية الديمقراطية إضافة إلى الناطق الرسمي باسم قوى السورية الديمقراطية. تيلل سيلو was a high-ranking commander and spokesman for the rebranded YPG until November 2017 when he defected. أنا صرحت أن قوى السورية الديمقراطية عبارة عن مسرحية كان المقصود فيها الإظهار للرأي العام الداخلي والعالمي أن هي قوات فعلا من كافة مكونات القطر العربي السوري ولكن للأسف اتضح لأن بعد تأسيس القيادة هي قيادة كردية قيادة تتبع لحزب العمال الكردستاني كان في تنسيق كامل ما بينه وبين التحالف الدولي وعلى رأس الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية لتأسيس القوات تحت التسمية هي I don't know if viewers have seen it, but an American general actually said in an interview that the name Syrian Democratic Forces uh, was made up simply to change the name from YPG, because YPG is connected to this PKK movement. The Syrian Democratic Forces was just a name they made up. And the Americans said, it works. They can now, if they don't have to discuss YPG, they can just say, SDF every time, but it's the same group. The American is Raymond Thomas, one of U.S.'s senior generals. Nearly two years later, Thomas would admit that the name YPG is simply a wordplay to win public support and deny Turkish concerns. They formally called themselves the YPG, who the Turks would say equated to the PKK, you're dealing with a terrorist 
enemy of mine, uh, how, you know, how, how can you do that ally? So we literally played back to them, hey, you gotta change your brand. You know, what, what do you wanna call yourself besides the YPG? And with about a day's notice, they declared that they were the Syrian Democratic Forces. I thought it was a stroke of brilliance to put democracy in there somewhere, uh, <laughs> but it gave them a little bit of credibility. طبعا انا ذكرت يعني عباره عن اسم هي اولا قوات بس بالتسميه هي قوات سوريه وانما القياده بالكامل هي قياده كرديه تتبع لحزب العمال الكردستاني بالاسماء انا ذكرتهم من اعتبارا من قائد القوات اللي هو شاهين تشيلو هو عضو يعتبر بالهيئه المركزيه لحزب العمال الكردستاني تبين لأننا من خلال لقاءاتنا مع أطراف التحالف وخاصة ضباط من الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية ضباط عسكريين وضباط من المخابرات أنهم على علاقة مسبقة بشاهين تشيلو A global public relations campaign has now restyled the YPG from being a terror group to freedom fighters Don't be fooled by the pretty song These women are Kurdish fighters from the People's Protection Units or YPG The YPG uh, has been very good at propaganda in terms of emphasizing uh, the role of women at the forefront of the violence um, against uh, Islamic State. This uh, public relations strategy has endeared uh, many people in the West uh, to the YPG and to the Kurds who are seen as uh, sort of a friendly, secular alternative to groups that support Sharia law. Also, a lot of Americans admire the, the Kurdish women fighters. They see fighters there uh, in units of women without hijabs. They see them uh, as a more of um, um, a people who represent people that would have Western-type um, cultures. You know, the YPG, or the PKK if you want, has a very good publicity uh, apparatus in Western Europe and also in Turkey. They manage to put out their story very successfully, very well, and the only thing lacking is the truth. Because uh, very often they, do, they are so far from telling the truth that you don't know quite what universe, uh, whether you're on the same planet or not. Turkey has spent much of this year reeling from a series of terror attacks and a series of threats coming from multiple directions. Turkey's biggest city has been hit for the fifth time this year, this time by two bomb explosions. The PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, a Kurdish separatist movement that has battled with the government for decades now. Um, there have been terror attacks in Turkey that came out of Syria. There were a number of bombings in Turkey in 2016, which were planned and organized in Syria, and the operatives who carried them out from the YPG came out of Syria. Bombings in places like Ankara and Istanbul. What we are hearing uh, from Kurdish fighters inside the town. For now, the media is sold on the fight for Kobani, visible only from a hillside in Turkey. Journalists rely solely on footage posted by the YPG. It brings them closer to the battle, but not close enough to see what is really happening. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Roy Gutman spent months in northern Syria investigating the YPG and how it managed to both grow and survive in the volatile Syrian front line. Essentially, it was in 2012 that the regime decided uh, it was uh, going to withdraw most of its forces from the region. <laughs> And they chose the YPG uh, to take it over. So it was basically uh, set up as a kind of a proxy by the uh, Assad regime. Gutman later went to Kobani to see things for himself. I discovered that the defense of the outlying towns, which 
was described by the YPG's spokespeople as very, very serious and fierce. In fact, according to uh, residents of Kobani, who f later fled to Turkey, was either non-existent or uh, was very modest at best. Residents of those towns, they were actually ordered to leave the towns. They wanted to defend them, but they were told by the YPG, get out. Running for their lives, refugees flee from the fighting in Syria. They end up in southern Turkey, hoping to see the city. They fled, save from ISIL siege. Turkish authorities have set up four camps in Suruç to house the refugees, mainly Syrian Kurds who are fleeing the fighting in Kobani. In the searing heat, they come in their thousands, descending on the Turkish border with whatever belongings they can carry. The Syrian regime kept an, an intelligence cell in Kobani. So local people from Kobani told me that many of the targets that were where the Americans were directed by the YPG to attack, and they probably had the, gu the guidance of the Syrian intelligence as well. <laughs> They belonged to uh, civilians who opposed the Assad regime, who, who opposed the YPG. The YPG had moved all of its forces from the town of uh, Kobani to uh, Tel Aviv because they were about to carry out a kind of a cleansing of the, of the Arabs there. And uh, they, they abandoned Kobani. So what did the YPG do? They put out uh, propaganda that the Turks had allowed the ISIS fighters uh, into Kobani because it's right across the border and to escape uh, from Kobani. And this uh, was a lie. The next episode of Syria, the backstage, looks at fighters coming from all over the world to join the PKK's Syrian branch and how it fast becomes a threat to Turkey.